Hello everyone, this is Angel Miller with peopleofshambhala.com. Uh, welcome back. I hope you're all well. One of the things I want to do with the podcast is uh, explore spirituality, not just in the abstract, but in how we actually live our lives. I think it's important with um, so many issues today, from uh, political problems to problems of the environment to problems of uh, what exactly is going in our food, that uh, we address some of these issues and uh, try to figure out how we can either uh, make our society a better place or at the very least improve our own lives and hopefully the lives of uh, some other people around us. Uh, spiritual people are often very creative individuals, but there's often a disconnect between spirituality and uh, our work, and that's something I think we need to uh, confront. We're going to be speaking to Dharma teacher and author Parang Jerry Larkin. Uh, she was the founder teacher of Still Point Zen Buddhist Temple. Uh, she was ordained in 1995 after completing her training at the Maitreya Buddhist Seminary. Her latest book is Close to the Ground, Reflections on the Seven Factors of Enlightenment, and some of her other books include Love Dharma and Stumbling Towards Enlightenment. We're going to be discussing one of her older books, though, Building a Business the Buddhist Way, and we're going to be looking at how we can create some prosperity in our own lives by applying the uh, lessons of Buddhism and dharma to our work. Instead of seeing our work as something extraneous to our spiritual lives, instead we're looking at work as a way of uh, manifesting our spirituality. Uh, we want our spiritual life to grow and we should want our own prosperity to grow. Uh, we're going to be looking at how to do that ethically and uh, in line with the dharma. Parang Jerry Larkin, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you, Angel. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, great. And um, you, you've written several books, but uh, you came to my attention a, a few months back uh, when I was re reading uh, one of your older books, actually, Building a Business the Buddhist Way. And um, what struck me was just uh, the advice in there and uh, your assessment of the, the world and earning an income today, or well, a few years ago then. It's, it's much more relevant now than I think it would have seemed uh, even at the time that you wrote it. I was really surprised how uh, it really uh, caught the mood today and it's sort of years, years ahead of its time really. But uh, maybe first of all you could just tell us a little bit about your background because it, it's pretty interesting. I know you came out of a more corporate world and are now uh, teaching the Dharma. So. Right, right. Oh, I'm happy to do that. Well, first of all, thank you for discovering the book. I'm just so touched by that. But yes, my background kind of proves the book on a lot of levels, Angel. I mean, I got a PhD in statistics. Basically, it was called policy analysis because there was a lot of social research involved. Never used it. Because I think I did some um, surveys for nonprofits for free just to practice, but I ended up working for a foundation, and then I was part of the cabinet council for the governor of Michigan for a couple of years, and then ended up at Deloitte as part of the management consultant team, and loved my work, absolutely loved my work, and realized that while I loved working for a corporation, I mean, Deloitte at the time was a great place to work, I wanted to work with nonprofits, and because of the, you'll be familiar with this coming from New York, because I had to charge so much for my hours, I couldn't reach nonprofits and they couldn't reach me. All right. So I left. And when I left, the irony, and I'm, I'd be, I'm happy to say this to you, the irony of my leaving is I actually made more money working out of my bedroom as somebody who was a Buddhist and had specific Buddhist principles, you know, that I used to screen who I could work with and who I couldn't work with. It was just wild. Yeah. But uh, that, that's when I wrote this book because I thought, oh my gosh, people need to know that you don't have to give up your values to be successful in starting or building a business. You do not have to give up your values. Right. And that is the kind yeah. of implicit assumption. Uh, and I think with spiritual people, there's almost this feeling that, well, uh, earning a living is yeah. just dirty, so I'm just going to have to abandon my principles to do it. Yeah, no. No, not not at all. I mean, you know, the great irony of my life is, looking back um, to those years, was that 
people yeah. looked for me. I mean, people had to find me. Right. Angel, I wasn't. I didn't advertise or anything. People, it was almost word of mouth finding me. Right. And to a client, they came to me because of my values, and I think that right. that's so important. And now, more than ever, we need to trust the people we work with. You know, yeah. the people we buy from or we sell to. Mm. And one of the ways to do that, maybe the only way, ultimately. It's by seeing how they interpret their own values and how they do their bi do business. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it mm. really, really matters. But you don't have to compromise. You know, Buddha was kind of a character with this kind of advice because he said, you don't have to be poor. Being spiritual doesn't mean you have to be poor. I mean, some of us may choose to be poor, mm. but what? but you can make great money. I mean, he actually said that. But then what you need to do is share it. You know, you need to take a third of it so you live a good life, a third of it so you d aren't dependent on anybody in your elder years, mm. and a third of it give away. Well, you need, that's a lot of money <laughs> to make mm. that much money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and in your um, in your book building a business the Buddhist way, you also yes. mention that you're going to have to go into the interior and it could be painful. And uh, so yes. and I don't think that most people think that about a job because it seems to be something like that. Well, okay, I don't want to do it, but I have to. But it's not really me. Oh, yeah, yes, you're right. I did. Ma I was a management consultant. For, I want to say ten years, and I do everything obsessively. Just for you know, you yeah. know, Angel. It's just one of my things. Yeah. And one of the um, what, one of the things I learned was that people who took the time to remember this is going to sound so la la, but it's so true to really be honest about what they loved to do as yeah. kids, like what their first loves were, and translated that somehow into their work were way more successful than other people. All other things held equal, yeah, equally. And the reason was because when you start a business. You really have to go on faith right, for a right, while. Exactly. I mean, you have to kind of trust your own gut. And if it's fun, this is one of these secret things. If it's fun, yeah. you'll do it. Like, if it's fun, you'll kind of... I mean, I hate to say to people, go out and obsess. But when you're starting a business, especially, as you probably know, obsession isn't a bad thing because you need to think about so many aspects of the business. Yeah. And when it's something you love to do because you've loved it since you were a kid, you do it. Right, right. Yeah, and that energy, that positive energy, attracts other people who have similar values, and then it snowballs. Yeah, that's right. And I guess, yeah. um, and I guess if you, if you're trying to um, put into practice something that you've loved since a child, it's essentially very mm -hmm. positive. You're not thinking about, well, who can I, who can I exploit, or how can I pay this person less, or something like that, which you know. Oh can happen. yeah, yeah. To exploit anything or anybody is the worst possible thing any of us can do. Yeah. You know, Angel, it's so funny you would say that, you know, I live on very little. I'm actually, I love living on very little. Yeah. But the one thing that I donate to is the um, anti-exploitation of other people, nonprofits. Oh, really? Yeah. And I do because in my own heart, I honestly can tell you that any exploitation of another person harms more than we realize on so many levels, mm. starting with ourselves. Yeah. So to 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 succeed in business because because you trick somebody else is one of the worst things you can possibly do. Mm. And part of it is just on a practical level, is that I can assure you that if somebody tricks somebody else in business, it's a small enough world so that word gets out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and to build the business. You really, in the end, all you have is your own personal reputation. Yeah. You know, it might take a while for other people to track you down. I mean, the media is how it's all unfolding about Wall Street now is kind of proof mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. But you get tracked down sooner or later. Mm. And so it's it's not about exploitation. In fact, the, the opposite is true. Again, not just loving what you love, but people who are very generous from the get-go. Yeah. Also succeed. Hmm. You know, the prof profit sharing, even if you only have $5 and you're splitting it five, yeah. five ways, which I've been known to do, the profit sharing, um, the transparency in a company, the, the, the courage to be vulnerable and right. to say, here's what I'm trying to do, here's what I'm good at, here's what I suck at. Those right. kinds of things are the kinds of things that build really successful businesses. It's just amazing how this has been lost in the noise of 
the last four or five years. Yeah, it is. And yeah, yeah. I mean, last week um, a friend of mine told me he just got a new job, and uh, uh-huh. and he was he was saying, oh yes, he went for the interview, and one of the people there said, well, you realize what you're getting yourself into. And it's going to be tough. And he was saying, you know, we're going to be here till midnight and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and uh, from what my friend said, it's 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 really that bad and then quite a bit worse. And uh, mm-hmm. it just seemed to me to be, I mean, we've, we've, I, we've probably all been in that sort of situation to, to yeah. a greater or yeah. lesser extent. But it just yeah. seems that there can be a lot of abusiveness. I mean, from personally, from yeah. my experience, that when you work till midnight, yeah. you probably do no more than you would have done if you left the four o'clock because you just slow down to the point where it's, you're, you're, you're doing right. nothing. So, right. But uh, it seems almost that uh, some people just want to keep you there to have control over you. Maybe they're a bit strange, actually, <laughs> or something like yeah. that. But um, yeah. what, what do you feel about this, um, this sort of ethos of, you know, we have to be working all the time and that's the most important yeah. thing in our lives? Yeah, it's the opposite. You know, the opposite is what yeah. works. I'm surprised companies still do that. Well, yeah. you know, I don't know how far, how deep you, deeply you want to speak about this, Andrew, but a lot of that's driven by fear. Yeah. Starting with the companies, you know, being af- being afraid that they can't keep up with what they need to keep up with. Right. And that's driven by not having enough employees to start with. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a hard thing to figure out. But the, yeah, right. uh, the problem with Midnight for your friend is that if he sits down and looks at what he's making an hour, yeah. he would make more money at Starbucks. Yeah, well, I actually did mention this to someone else, that, you know, it's probably he's probably earning yeah. quite a bit of money, but, you know, he could be doing two jobs and making the same, so what's the point? You know? Right, right, exactly. But the harder lesson, and, and I'm happy to talk about balance in a minute, but the harder lesson is that anybody who works until midnight, I don't care who it is, they're too exhausted for any spiritual practice or real relationship work. Yeah. And we're not we're not put on this we're not on the planet, this sweet little broken planet. Yeah. To not grow spiritually. I mean it's right. just like, wait a minute, why why do you want to do that? Why do you want to harm yourself so much? So mm. in Buddhism, I'm sure there are teachings in Hinduism, Andrew, I just can't come up with them. So I'll come up with um a Dogen teaching, and Dogen, D-O-G-E-N, is one of these great old, rugged, kind of grouchy old Zen teachers from Japan, and he wrote this wonderful book called Instructions to the Cook, and it might be a book you might want to give to your friend. Okay. And one of the things he said was that if, if you have any chance of growing or maturing spiritually, any chance at all, then you need to have set components in your life. Mm. One of them is working, but it's only one out of five. Right. You know, you need to have a spiritual practice. You need to be learning something. It almost doesn't matter what you're learning as long as you're learning. And that goes, you know, it's interesting how all the um, neurological studies are showing that. It's to keep your brain plastic. But you, you need spiritual practice. You need to learn. You need to work. You need to do social action yeah. where you're doing something for somebody else. And you need relationships. Mm. And when we look at our own lives, or I'll just use me as Exhibit A, Angel, (laughs) when I've been really off balance or grumpy, all I have to do is think of those five elements and say to myself, oh my gosh, you know, I've been so selfish (laughs) for the last month, no wonder I'm a grouch. Or, you know, it would be good if I called my mother. (laughs) Right, yeah. You know, and so what's kind of heartbreaking about your story about your friend, and I know this is, you know, being duplicated in the millions all over yeah, the world, it is. is that they're losing, is that people are losing balance. Yeah. And the problem with that is that the people who pay are the people who aren't getting help with the social action, the people that we have relationships with, yeah. not to mention ourselves. And it just, mm-hmm. it's just a heartbreaker. You know, when I, my first job, my first real job was with IBM, of all places. Okay. And IBM in those days, forever ago, had a policy where they wanted everybody out of the building by 6 p.m. Really? Wow. And the reason, and I, it'd be interesting to see if they still do this, but the reason yeah. was they said, you should be able to do all the work you need to do by 6 o'clock at night. Yeah. So people were penalized for not, not getting done. 
mm-hmm. because if they couldn't get it done, then they needed to have the courage to say, I need help. I mean, it was just huge. Mm-hmm. You know, and even when I was at Deloitte Angel, there was this, you know, it's a culture, it's a funny kind of a cultural thing. There was the same cultural thing that I'm sure your friend walked into where, you know, whoever works, whoever works the longest is the best, right? Yeah, that's there right. on Saturday yeah, morning, yeah. right? But I was a single mother trying to raise a daughter. And when I hired on with them, I said, you will get up to 60 hours of work from me. It'll be the best 60 hours you get from anybody else. Don't you dare ask me to not take her to her soccer games or I'll quit. And what was interesting about that was they not only did they never, ever hold me accountable, but later when I went back and said, oh, by the way, I only want to work four days a week. Now, this is for Deloitte. They were fine with that because I made the case. And so a lot of this is we don't know that we can say no. You know, it's it's interesting looking for jobs, and this might be the most helpful to your um, listeners, Angel. When we when people when we start to interview for jobs these days, I go through this with my son. We're so worried you won't get the job that it doesn't occur to us to make the case for why we're the best person that yeah. that company could find. Right. What's interesting about making the best case, and the way you do that is by saying, "Here are problems that I'm guessing you are having, company, that yeah. I can solve." So you're positioning yourself as a solution. When you Mm -hmm. position yourself as a solution, then you can almost call the shots by saying, oh, by the way, I don't work past 7 o'clock at night. Who doesn't want the solution? Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is, actually. It is. And so one of, one of the reasons I, I wanted to speak to you, apart from the fact that I just, I just love your book and it's just really, oh. it's a gem. But um, oh. I think one of the reasons why it's a, why it's a gem is because, um, the, you know, the, the world is, is, is changing pretty rapidly. But yeah. every, everyone I know, uh, I think anyway, um, has some kind of sideline. And maybe they're not intending to make money out of their sidelines. Mm-hmm. Some mm-hmm. cases they are, some some cases they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, mm-hmm. I have friends who are involved in uh, fine art, right. fashion on the side, right. uh, writing, obviously, and uh, you know, and the internet is sort of facilitating this to mm-hmm. quite a, a large degree. But uh, uh-huh. I, w- I wonder if you had any, uh, what kind of advice you you would give people just sort of starting out, having small things on the side, whether it's a business or whether yeah. it's maybe a blog where they never intend to make any money out of it. But you know, there's still you still have to have some kind of uh, ethics for it probably to grow. So I wonder what you yes. would uh, uh, say to them. Yes. Yeah. Well, the first thing about sidelines is they're perfect startup businesses because yeah. most people start their sidelines because they're good at it and they like it. Yeah. And so my reaction to people with sidelines is to ask them to take a deeper look at it and to actually try to wrap the business plan around it to see if they could make it their real livelihood. Mm. The the good thing about sidelines is you kind of subsidize it with your day job. Right. So there's an income there. And what incomes do is, ironically, they help you to make better decisions because you're not terrified you won't eat next week. Yeah. Um, But with, with sidelines, oh, my gosh, I mean, my response is always, please do a business plan and see what you need to do to make this your real livelihood. Right. Because you put way more heart and energy into it than you will for anybody else. I mean, it isn't anything personal against our employers. It's just that we do. It's just how we are. Mm -hmm. And the the one thing about sidelines that I always say, and I'll say this, this will be the last sentence out of my mouth when I'm dying. (laughs) Don't hire your family. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> don't. Don't hire your family because it causes so many problems. It's, it, it, you know, fr- if you do friends, you need to have some kind of a contract so it's clear what to expect from each other. But yeah. it's hard to hire family because when you need to, f- a company grows, but one of the things that happens, Angel, is it's like a snake shedding its skin. Yeah. When companies grow, the, you need different people from the people who started the company. Right. Yeah. I mean, trying to hire to fire your sister, it's just not going to happen. And no. <laughs> so I see lots and lots of businesses get stuck. Yeah. And they were almost all these sideliner startup businesses. Oh, really? And um and it's because it's it's one of three things. It's either they've they've missed their market. They haven't figured out who to sell to. Mm. That's But that's only one. The second thing, and it's the second reason why businesses fail, is they've grown too fast. 
so they don't have the resources to hold right. up their end of the yeah. sales. And the third reason, somebody in their family is screwing up the work. They don't mean to. They just are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but sidelines are perfect. Mm. Startup businesses. And, oh, there's so many opportunities. Um, one of the things about sidelines is, is Angel, is if people have several sidelines, they might want to focus on one. Yeah. And grow that. And in this market, kind of one, I don't even know how to say this, um, one product businesses will do really well. Right. What I mean by that is that the marketplace is really noisy right now. Yeah. And we're, we none of us have an attention span. So if you say to me, I'll just use Eugene as an example. Okay. In Eugene, there are lots and lots of, of great food carts. They're fabulous. But if you say to me, I have a food cart and I sell juices and smoothies and uh, Indian food and another thing, I can't remember that. Right. But if you say to me, I have a food cart on River Road and I only sell one thing and that is the best chocolate malted milkshake in the Northwest, I'll remember that. Right. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and so I do. that's the thing about sidelines. Mm. There needs to be one thing that people can remember. Now, yeah. what's interesting about that is I may go to that food cart for the chocolate malted and find out they've got the best French fries. Can you tell I'm hungry? They have the best <laughs> French fries, you know, this, this, you know, on this side of the um, country, and I might get those, but it's not how I'm going to remember to go to that place. Right. So with sidelines, it's really, really important to be more focused than you feel comfortable with. Mm. So, so with writing, for example, if you're good at writing a number of things. Yeah. It almost doesn't matter that you're good at a number of things. What matters is that you write the best articles about pharmaceutical companies right. who are harming children yeah. of anybody out there writing. And right. that's what gets you the best jobs. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it very much does, actually, because I must good. admit that, that I have several skills and I can sometimes get a little bit flustered about what to do, which one to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's the downside of having lots of um, talent. Yeah. Sometimes and, the. Sometimes, and, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. It's, and and the, the the trick there, and this goes back to marketing, and I actually spent a lot of time mar on marketing in this book because people don't learn it anywhere. But the thing is, is what we have to do is we have to help people remember for the one thing. Yeah. And they'll buy other things, but what's the one thing? You know what? Right. And then that goes back to for the entrepreneur, for people starting businesses. You know why not? Why can't it be the one thing we love doing the most? Yeah. And 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 market that. Mm. So, for example, um, I'll, I'll give you an example in Michigan. In Michigan, when I was doing the management consulting, mm. I was it was actually pretty broad, but I what I loved doing the best was working with these old guys who were suppliers to the auto industry who were working out of a garage in their backyard. They made a fortune. Wow. Angel, they were, they made, they, they were cash cows is what we used to call wow. I mean, absolutely cash cows. When I would go to visit them, to talk to them about how they might want an accountant to stay out of jail, <laughs> oh, I would really? go with wow. somebody who, who, the best thing I did, I would Walk in and say, here's what I do. I work with guys like you. I don't work with anybody else. I work with guys like you. Hmm. And then I would tell them stories about other people I work with had similar kinds of companies. And they'd be like, yeah, okay. Or I have a sister who's a CPA. She's a genius CPA angel. Yeah. But she only works with truckers. It's funny. I'm listening to myself <laughs> talk about these women. She will only work with truckers. Oh, really? But what's great about it is truckers love her. She's oh, really? mouthy. <laughs> they show up and she's got the coffee mugs. You know, I mean, it's just hilarious. And she makes a fortune. Wow. And truckers, okay. I mean, she lives in this, you know, western Massachusetts. And people always know when it's tax time because yeah. all these big, huge trucks are pulling up. <laughs> so, but, but can you see how much fun that is? Yeah, I can actually. Yeah, and it works. It works because what happens is you build your integrity in this tiny little pond, and then the pond grows for you. You don't have right. to grow. It means you don't have to advertise. Yeah. You don't have to go schmooze. 
you know, you don't have to go and put yourself out there. You know, most spiritual people are introverts anyway. Yeah. So we don't need to go out, you know, and pretend we're loving these parties we don't love. Right. <laughs> Instead, what we're doing is a fabulous job with the two or three people we are working for. They tell everybody else. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and there are these yeah. sort of strange niches that you would never think of, right? And that's certainly one of them, I have oh. to say. <laughs> yeah. And there, yeah, but when you start to think about this, mm. you know, and the way to find them, I mean, you can brainstorm with your best friends. It's, this mm. isn't rocket science. This is, you know, inviting three or four of your best friends t- t- for coffee and just saying, can you help me figure out what a niche is for me? You mm. know, which is this market that I should go after. Can I just tell you what I love to do as a kid and what I think I'm really good at now? Yeah. And I guarantee by the end of an hour, you'll have two or three niches you haven't thought of. The only yeah. thing is you can't say that's a lousy idea. You can't tease each other when you do it. Okay. <laughs> you know, when people come up with ideas, you can't go, oh my God, that's the most stupid idea I've ever heard. You have to go, oh yeah, okay, and build on it. Kind of like improv. Oh, right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. It's just like improv where there's no, no. There's yes, and. You know, okay. yes, and I could be a CPA for truckers. Yes, and I could be a CPA, you know. Right. And what will happen is, out of that, every time I've ever done anything like that, Angel, I, there have been at least three or four fabulous ideas. Mm. I mean, as in like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't think about that myself. Oh, really? Then what I do is I go out and say, who else is doing this? I told a little story in the book, but who else is right. doing this? And invariably, there'll be somebody else who is doing a much better job than I could ever do. Right. Usually because their website is fabulous. But okay. a much better job than I could ever do, and that'll rule out two of them. And then I've got two to really focus on. But yeah, mm. it, it's fun. And then it's fun because it becomes like, kind of like, where's Waldo is the only way I know how to describe it. It's right. fun. It becomes kind of a scavenger hunt that you, you where you then kind of sca- figure out where are the places where the people are who are going to buy this and how will I find them so they know I exist and it becomes fun. Right. Uh, there, you know, there are many different uh, ways that we can make a bit of a living on the side or maybe full time now. Yeah. And But I, I wonder, how, you know, how should we, we, we're going to have some kind of customer base, you know, and how should we interact with them in a, in a with dharmic the customers? way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with integrity. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is integrity. Right. And, uh, you know, integrity from a Buddhist perspective, yeah. you know, we live with the precepts. We start with not harming. Right. As of the first screen is if there's anybody, who, I mean, it goes back to your friend with the midnight hours, mm-hmm. you know, if there's anybody or anything that'll be harmed, mm-hmm. then that goes against Buddhist precepts. So that's a pretty good screen right there. Right. Okay. And with, with customers, what I've always done is I've always been very clear about what I can and cannot do and when. Okay. And I've always been really honest about things. So, mm. uh, so just a recent example, I um, write a, a column for a magazine that's really fun for me because it's a little Dharma talk. Okay. And they, over, they overpaid me. Okay. I mean, it's like something everybody would love, right? Yeah. So they overpaid me. I don't keep good records, even though I talk a good game. You know, if this was an accountant, you would, one would think. <laughs> but I knew they had overpaid me. And so I basically emailed them and said, you overpaid me, so don't pay me. Stop paying me until you catch up with me. Okay. And, you know, that kind of thing is, is kind of unheard of. But yeah. here's what's really interesting, Angel. So the next email I get, they say to me, thank you. We'd like to increase what we pay you for your column. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's mm. the integrity. When somebody can count on you to tell the truth, I mean, I could tell you story after story of Deloitte where I'd be working on somebody with a business plan and I'd say, I think I can do this for you within a month. It'll be tight, but I think I can do it. Now, and I would never say that, Angel, unless I, was, I had doubled the time I really thought it would take. Right, okay. Because I wanted to make sure it would that I would be on time. I mean, yeah. I just, because I knew it was one of the indicators of integrity. That right. was why. It was not so much the being on time. It was like, how can people trust my word? Right. If I knew I was going to be late, the minute I knew I was going to be late, I would call up the client to say, it's going to be late. Here's why. Here's what I'm going to do about it. Okay. I just want to keep you posted. Mm. And I would always give them the right to renege. In fact, I never wrote a contract with a customer, ever. Oh, really? Okay. Never. I would now, though. 
You would, you? okay. I would. I would just because of the way the world is right now. I would oh, now. Really? I mean, I never did then, but I just think it's okay to have a contract. But I would have a clear, easy to read, yeah. a sixth grader understands contract. Mm, okay. But So the bottom line is always integrity. And ironically, one of the best ways to prove integrity is to say you're sorry or you've been wrong or you've made a mistake. Because mm. people can't believe you had the guts to own it. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. It yeah, and that goes back, it, that goes right back to the precepts of, you know, don't lie. Yeah. Don't steal. Mm -hmm. You know, don't harm. Don't, you know, don't, don't, well, it depends on which Buddhist you talk to, but don't use drugs yeah. or abuse drugs or alcohol. Yeah. You know, don't be sexually promiscuous, which could be a whole right. other interview between us. Yeah. You know, so, so well, that people. That. <laughs> Yeah, so people can be comfortable, yeah. So people can be really comfortable right. with you as a person who, and here's the punchline, is helping them to grow their business. Right. Mm -hmm. Or is helping them to improve their life. Mm. Yeah. That's completely in keeping with, you know, everything I understand about Hinduism, but for, for sure with Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And so, yeah. in a way, you know, if we are, you know, Buddhist or Hindu or just spiritual, you know, instead of uh -huh. instead of thinking, oh boy, you know, I have to enter the rat race or do something dirty for a living, you know, we should just approach yeah. it that, no, I'm going to be, uh, there's going to be radical honesty and I'm going to yeah. really live up to, and not just um, like my personality, but the values yeah. that I aspire to have, you know. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah, and to keep the values right in front of you all the time because right. it's easy to it's an yeah. easy slide down. Yeah. And the other thing I would say um, to you, Angel, is yeah. that there are ways to enter the rat race and ways not to enter the rat race. So for okay. me, my reaction to entering the rat race is, "Yay, I get to enter the rat race because right. I get to be the one with the integrity." Do you right. see what I'm saying? Yeah. I get to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it makes it fun. Mm -hmm. A big part of this being in business and using it as spiritual practice. Right. is remembering that it's fun and yeah. that it can be fun and yeah. what needs to happen for it to be fun because the things that are making it not fun are probably things that are rubbing up against the precepts yeah that's right yeah mm. and, and i just i just wonder because we have quite a few uh, uh readers from india and uh and countries uh in asia uh -huh. where the economy is definitely not as strong as uh yes. some western com countries but you know whether where, the, where they uh -huh. are building businesses and uh -huh. um and i think you know some of those businesses maybe can involve some exploitation of people there uh some of them not so uh, but I wonder if you have any advice for for people that are living in in Asia. Actually, uh, what, what do you think uh, m might help their businesses grow? I mean, you know, apart from trying to apply the principles of Dharma. But... Sure. Well, everything we've talked about yeah. certainly. Um, yeah. But the other thing is having spent some time in Asia. Yeah. So I think the Asi the Asian men and women I met who were entrepreneurs. Yeah. Most Asians I met were, by the mm. way, were very good at knowing um, how to make their products. Oh, really? Okay. What happened was, yeah, the issue is an issue of financing, right? And and what I saw work over and over again were these tiny little loan funds, right? They're like micro loans right. that would help. And a lot mm. of people say to me, "Well, we have no money." And what mm. I would say back to them, and I actually learned this. Hmm. from a quilt co-op in Kentucky. Okay. What what does work is you don't have a lot of money and I don't have a lot of money, but we each have $5. Right. So if we can find 20 people with $5, we yeah. can buy, you know, the four yards of cloth we need to start making yeah. these, with, you know, fill in the blank here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or we can buy, we can rent the plot of gr ground, mm -hmm. or we can buy the good seats instead mm. of the cheap seats that don't work, mm. or whatever, or get the water, you know, get, get the tiles so we can get the water here, mm. or, you know, or buy the cart that so we can actually clean so the food doesn't harm people. Right. It, 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 it doesn't take a lot of money. I mean, the good yeah. news about outside of the United States is that the same level of success comes from much less startup money. Right. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, it does and, absolutely. 
Yeah, and so a little bit goes a long way. Mm. And here, the thing that makes it work and that makes it fun, here I am back at fun, <laughs> is if you get a group of, and it would work here too, by the way, but if you get a group of, say, 10 friends and family in Asia <laughs> who all say, I can kick in $2 yeah. to this fund, what you do is you say, I'm the first person, I'll pay back the fund, and then let's pick the next person who's going to start his or her business. Oh, really? Okay. So everybody gets mm. to use the pot up ah, before, it, isn't it? Yeah. And what happens is you build this sangha, if you will, of people who have a personal interest in each other's success. Yeah. First of all, because they want the loan to be paid back. Mm. Do you see? Yeah. No, yeah, that's interesting. And, and maybe that's even yeah. something that could be tried in the West here and there as well. So, oh yeah, it totally could work here. Yeah, I mean, it works for it works. You know, co-ops in the South have used this oh, this really? kind of a thing for forever. Oh yeah, mm. okay. yeah. I mean, it's just it's this is all tried and true. Mm. Yeah, and it's fun. Okay, great. Mm. Yeah, just don't hire. Just, and maybe this might not be so true in the U.S. <laughs> you can't hire. You may not hire your family. <laughs> okay. 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 And so, what, what, uh, could you just uh, wrap up and give us the, the what you think are the basic principles of uh, of you know earning a earning a living in accordance with dharma? Yes, I'm happy to. Okay. But the first the first principle is to be clear about your values. Yeah. Be really clear about what your values are. To know you don't have to compromise them. The second thing is to have uh, a real clear picture of what it is you want to do that makes money yeah. and base it on, you know, what you loved as a child or what you love to do now. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing to do is to really figure out who it is that will buy this product and to uh -huh. not start trying to sell it until yeah. you've proven to yourself. You don't have to prove it to anybody else, but prove it to yourself that there's somebody out there that really wants what you're selling. Mm. And then just go for it. I mean, really, just go for it. Life is short. Okay, great. And I think the you know yeah. the, the something implied in what you say is, which maybe hasn't been spelled out, is that if you are living up to your values or trying to, and creating something, you're not going to be creating junk. You're going to be creating something that is of quality and something that actually contributes absolutely. something of beauty to the world. In some oh, sense. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that always is the way it plays out. Great. Okay, yeah, great. I it always, always, Angel. I can't yeah. think of a single exception to that rule. Thank yeah. you. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, it's been great speaking to you, but perhaps you can just tell us where people can learn more about your your books and maybe get in contact with you or learn more about your teaching. Sure. Um, well, building a business the Buddhist way, they'll have people will have to look in used bookstores and on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, for that, but I have their books. Um, I just wrote a book close to the ground. Okay, great. It came out last spring, and it's wonderful. It's a sweet little book about the factors of enlightenment. It's fun. Okay. And, you know, Angel, I think the best way for people to get a hold of me is I'll give you my email. My email is author Jerry Larkin. So A U T H O R Jerry Larkin. Author Jerry Larkin at gmail.com. It's fine for people to email me okay, at, right. at author Jerry Larkin. And there are plenty of books about how to start a business. The main thing is to decide you want to do it, and yeah. then everything else will show up. Yeah. Good. Okay, thanks very much for speaking to us. I really enjoyed it. So, and I, I know good. I learned a lot, good and I love angel. your books. So. Good. Well, Angel, thank you so much, and good luck. Thank you.